Studio A3R. I am your host, Jennifer Slurtle. Studio A3R is dedicated to feature people and resources that help strengthen personal resilience, responsiveness, and reflection. It is my belief that your competitive advantage is the way you scan your environment and make decisions. I hope our program helps you make better decisions. In our last program, you had heard about Matthew May uh, talk a little bit about strategy and what the unicorn knows, but we did have some students from Rochester Institute of Technology that were interested in you as a person and some of your personal philosophy. So with that, I would like the class to begin. Evan, take the stage. Uh, hi, my name is Evan Moore. I'm from San Francisco, California, and I'm studying new medical technology development at RIT uh, from uh, the School of Individualized Study. Uh, so my question for you is, uh, so I went through a couple of your other talks, uh, in particular, a uh, TED talk you did a couple of years ago, uh, and I noticed this common the common thread of you know reduction subtraction. Uh, so I want to ask, like going in the opposite extreme of taking people who are constantly their first instinct is to do something, people who spend too much time thinking and they overthink it. Uh, how would you sort of get someone to sort of reduce their thought process and to actually lead into the action? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I um, I wrote a book. Uh, my, my previous book was called um, um, "Winning the Brain Game," and interesting that you bring up you know the the the, the leap to action and then inaction, um, overthinking. Um, those are two of the biggest thinking flaws um, on the planet. And every time I do any kind of ideation session. Um, whether it's a lean process improvement, whether it's a you know a strategy design session, those two polar extremes are are very clear to see in the room. And so it is a notion of how do you balance those two. And as a practical nature, um, and, and a lot of the exercises and warm up things that I do are meant to illustrate the the notion that gosh we leap to action far too quickly, um, and at the same time sometimes we think too much. Um, and actually make the problem we're trying to solve worse. And so how do you strike that balance? And one of the practical techniques I call frame storming. Um, there is, I, I think about problem solving in general. I don't care if it's at the strategy level, whether it's at the, the process level, um, as kind of three steps. There's pain storming, which is you're trying to identify the problem in the first place, right? Um, there's a lot to be said about that. Um, and then you're familiar with brainstorming. That's the third step. In the middle of those two is frame storming. Frame storming um, is basically queuing up the language of questions, which is why did this happen? Um, what if we do this? Or how might we do that? And the, the actual process of frame storming feels like brainstorming because we love to stick ideas out there real quick, not, you know, top, top of mind. Meanwhile, all the research is, is clear that brainstorming, um, the way that we've generally learned it is wholly ineffective because at the end of 20 minutes, you've got all the, the conventional ideas that people have thought about anyway out there. And then there's this, gosh, there's really nothing new here. Uh, what do we do? So then you kind of back into frame storming. So I purposefully and intentionally insert a step between I being able to identify the problem and then moving to the, the solutioning part. And it's called frame storming. Um, and so that's my practical answer to the question of how you balance those two polar extremes, because it gives you the feeling that you are acting like brainstorming. Um, in fact, what you're doing is properly framing the problem in such a way that you can solve it in a useful and novel way. So that's my that's my answer. Hope that makes sense. Uh, and I'll yeah. send you if you want more if you want more information on that. I'll I'll send you a link uh, or some material on that so you can read about it. Please do. Uh, and then if I could just ask a quick follow up, um, like what would you say the differences between decisive in action uh, and indecisive in action? Decisive in action and indecisive in action, correct? Yes. Uh, well, I think you already painted that picture. I mean, it's 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 leaping to solutions on in one in, in one instance and then um, overthinking it in the other. 
right? So um, both of which lead you to subpar solutions um, that aren't very innovative, aren't, aren't, certainly aren't elegant. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Kevin. I'm studying uh, makerspace technology through the School of Individualized Study. Um, and my question, I guess, is a little bit more like personal for me. But um, as someone who's done a lot, you know, written a lot of books and worked on a lot of projects, how do you stay focused on all of those and kind of keep your motivation up while you're, you know, you're balancing all the other stuff? Uh, great question because it has evolved over time, and I and I should dovetail into what um, Jen was talking about earlier. I would love to tell you that I've had this this wonderful plan of my career <laughs> that that uh, I had all this thought out, but it has been a lot of serendipity and and kind of being in the right place at the right time and a lot of happy accidents. Um, but I think the thing there's a there's a law of subtraction. Um, that I refer to as, uh, it goes something like this, creativity thrives under intelligent constraints. And one of the nice things about uh, business writing in particular is that you work under deadlines. Um, so when you write a business book, and a lot of people don't know this, you don't write the book first. I mean, you can, um, but what you generally do, especially if you're going to try and get a, a large established traditional book publisher um, to publish the book for you is that you submit a proposal. And often at times that proposal is just kind of a basic book marketing plan or a book business plan. Um, I actually just use, usually do a one or three, one to three page uh, concept and pitch that. And once that has been accepted, then you come up with the date of delivery of the manuscript. And I just back into that date. So that I know, for example, in what a unicorn knows, I had the framework in my mind. That's about it. Um, I had the five principles that I wanted to talk about. That's about it. I hadn't written really any any content at all. Um, and when the contract was signed, I knew that I had basically six months to deliver that manuscript. And I had essentially six chapters to write. So five chapters plus an introduction. I know from experience and this is going to sound really, really boring, but um, I know how many words I need to produce in what given time period and how my editing process goes. Um, and that's what keep, that's what keeps me motivated is that if I don't turn in that manuscript, um, uh, I, I have an angry, not angry, but you know, a publisher, an editor that that I now affect his or her work because uh, he or she is juggling other books, and I don't want that to happen. So, what keeps me going is the constraint of a deadline, um, and that goes for that, that goes for every single book that I've ever written. And how do I stay engaged uh, so that I make that deadline? That's just discipline. Um, there's no secret sauce to that. Um, I know that I can't write um, while I'm you know, working. So I have to do it in between the cracks of other things that I'm doing um, for real work. And I learned that from Toyota. So Toyota is a company that implements a million little ideas uh, a year, many of them out of the factory environment. Factory workers are making little tweaks during their, their lunch and mid-morning breaks, staying late, doing things on their own time. I happen to write from 4.30 to 7 in the morning when I'm in the throes of, of writing a book. I know that at 7 o'clock, the house wakes up. Um, there are too many distractions. Um, things become go from quiet to unquiet. And, and then I do my editing and rereading what I wrote that morning, that night, when everyone has gone to bed. And oftentimes, I find that I'm like, how did I, what, what, I, I can't even understand why I said what I said. And I'll just go back and, and rewrite it the following morning. So. That's my answer. Awesome, thank you. So um, Patrick isn't here, but I he was prepared. He's also a student in the School of Individualized Studies. And um, for those of you that don't know at RIT, the School of Individualized Studies has um, a series of cluster classes and really allows you to customize your own class. Um, before some students were concerned because it was less mainstream, but I think as we go into uh, decentralized and distributed education, I think those students that are in the SOIS program um, have a lead in 
because it really is affinity based learning, which is fantastic. And Patrick's question really was kind of like you have written six books. Um, do you have an affinity towards one of them? Is one of them more favorite than the other? Are they like children? Um, what do you think of your own work and what is your favorite? Uh, I do have a favorite. Um, <laughs> interestingly enough, is probably the worst performing book. Um, uh, it's called The Shibumi Strategy and it was a short fable. Um, and the reason I like it so much, it's fiction. Um, but has a practical uh, a practicum at the end, kind of like if you if you ever read any books by Patrick Lencioni, um, sort of in that in that genre. But the reason that I love it, um, it there, there's a couple of reasons. One, um, it like my very first book, it was an accident. Um, I, I didn't mean for it to be a book. It was a it started as a, a story, and I just shared it with my literary agent um, at the time, and he said, I think you know th this could be a book. Um, it came out during a time when um, people were kind of struggling, as we did a couple of years ago um, in the pandemic, came out um, and written during the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. It was uh, it hit the shelves 2010. And it was based on an amalgam of true stories of people that um, uh, I had known in my career, in my personal life that had had a sort of personal breakthrough or professional breakthrough. And I took bits and pieces of those stories and crafted characters out of them. And, and basically I wanted to answer the question of how would you, how would you engineer a breakthrough in your, in your life? Um, and I wanted to overlay some of the Eastern philosophy that I had learned um, while at Toyota. So there's a lot of Zen uh, principles in there and Japanese uh, management concepts. And I had sort of the mysterious, um, you all seen or, or heard of Karate Kid, where it's wax on, wax off, Mr. Miyagi. Well, I had my own Mr. Miyagi, but she was um, the main character's son's Aikido uh, teacher. Um, her name was Mariko. Um, and she departed um, or imparted all the wisdom uh, in the the character and his struggles. So that's my favorite book. Um, it's um, I don't know if you guys can 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 see this. It's the Shibumi Strategy. Um, I'll put links if you want, or Jen can write a powerful way to create meaningful change. Tiny little book. Um, it's probably I don't know less than a plane ride to uh, uh, to read it, but it's my favorite book. And the other reason is I got people who who it changed their life and it hit them at just the right time, and they they wrote to me um, telling me that, um, and so that was kind of a very cool thing to me. Anyway, I, I think honestly, um, like my book Strategy Leadership and the Soul came out in 2010, and I think I think this 2023, I think people are more interested in, in transformation themselves, and I think leaders and organizations are realizing that the the constraints are their own constraints. So I'm wondering if you even, you know, either reissued it or or just if we began circulating it, I suspect you'd even get greater readership now and we'll certainly make that happen. Um James, you're I've given it away. I I when when COVID hit, uh, I know that people when people were losing their jobs, I just gave the PDF away. I don't I mean, I didn't let my publisher know. It's it's so I just I just gave the whole PDF away. So I can, I'll send it to you. You can okay. share it. No, it is so, so important. And I think um, another thing that I really appreciate about you and your presence, your presence, your articulation, but the word eloquent and elegance, um, there's so much design thinking and even the way in which you're responding here. So um, I'm really hopeful everyone will take note. We'll go with James and then Matthew, you will have the last question. Thank you. Hi, I'm James. I'm also from the School of Indiv Individualized Studies. I have a focus in mechanical engineering and innovation management. So a little bit more on the innovation side of the engineering field. Um, a couple of questions I had was, and this is kind of a lead way, it turns out, from your last point, was uh, what are some insights from your books that you really hope readers will find the most valuable and uh, how they can apply that into their personal life? And then um, just to follow up off of that is, how do you think that individuals can take those lessons and really apply it to their own life, especially with like how competitive the world is today? Um, good question and a good good segue from previous discussion. Um, I'll, I'll focus on the notion of strategy. Um, as a matter of fact, 
When we think of strategy, we rarely think about it uh, in terms of our individual life, all right? I, a few minutes ago, I mentioned the fact that I didn't have a great strategic plan um, early on in my career. Everything kind of ha happened as an accident. It was an accident that I got to work with Toyota. It was an accident that my first book got published. I, I meant it to be a, a little pamphlet that I could build my business after leaving Toyota. And I passed it by a PR friend of mine and she sent it to an agent and he said, this should be a book. Um, it was just an accident, right? Just happy accidents. And But that it woke me up to the fact that um, you know accidents might not be the best strategy, Long term, um, hope isn't the best strategy, and maybe I need to think about that a little bit better. But strategy in general, when I learned it in business school, I hated it. It was completely left brain. I'm a recovering MBA, um, in case you don't know. Um, but you know, Wharton School probably gave it away um, in Jen's introduction. So, um, and I was a terrible finance, you know, analyst kind of person. I hated strategy the way I learned it. it I have a, I've an underdeveloped left brain. Is 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 my point. Um, and I'm, I got too much on the on the right brain until I met a gentleman by the name of Roger Martin. Um, if you don't know who Roger Martin is, not it wasn't all that far from where you all are located. He ran the uh, University of Toronto's Rotman School of Business for 15 to 20 years, um, became a close uh, protege of his uh, many years ago. Um, and he taught me this framework called playing to win, and it forms the basis for the first chapter in What a Unicorn Knows. But the very question um, that you just asked is the very question that that link that I put um, in the chat, um, which is now almost 10 years old, do you have a career strategy, a personal strategy? And because of the way that he defines strategy as a set of integrated choices that are designed to position you in, a, in, in such a way that um, you realize superior value, if you think about those words, isn't that kind of what we're what we're all doing? It's why you're in school. Um, it's what you're hoping to do when you leave school and and move into um, you know your professional uh, you know future. Um, strategy deals with the future, and it's about making choices. I didn't learn it that way. I learned that strategy was plan, you know, analyze, plan, execute. Um, the way that he teaches it, it's about choosing. It's about reverse engineering those choices and asking what would have to be true for those to be a good set of choices? What would have to be true for those to play out the way I'm thinking about it? And then anything that that seems to be worrisome, gives you the willies, keeps you up at night, you test it out um, real quickly so you don't spend a huge amount in terms of resources, time, money, effort, all of those things. Um, and so the link that I put in there is a quick answer to the question of how do you apply this to your personal and professional life. Um, I got one, one of the folks that that wrote a blurb on the cover of the book, his name or inside the cover, his name is Ken Kravanek. He runs a home building company up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, um, wrote to me, someone that I've known for years, and he said, you know, this book has personal application and I'm going to introduce it to my church group. So I think without sounding too arrogant that, um, and perhaps by accident, I, I do believe that the principles in this book, if you take them as a holistic set of guiding principles, and I mean that in a very, you know, very literal way, not a prescription, not a process, not a practice, but principles to guide you as vectors and you balance those out and apply them to your career and your personal life, your professional life, I think they, I think it should work. Um, and he's just a data point of one, um, but here's my answer. You've been listening to Matthew May and my hope is that what you hear are a series of considerations. I think one of the most respectful ways in which Matthew May leads is is by giving suggested frameworks. And I, I do see a lot of people want to plug and play. And I think being an, on the authentic quest of what is elegant, what works, what creates harmony, what creates congruence. These are all things that all six of Matthew May's books share. And I have really enjoyed having the School of Individualized Studies students be part of this program. I want to thank Scott Fitzgerald at Rock Fox Studio, our producer, and also our sponsor, executive coaching and strategy company, Agility 3R. Shh.